With today being the 6th of January, 2022, I am sure that almost every major newspaper, mainstream media outlet, and left-of-center blue checkmark is currently reminiscing on the horrors of what took place on that day one year ago. Something of which there has been endless reporting on, specials, committees, investigations, subpoenas, and Lord really only knows what else. I've heard a variety of nicknames given to the series of events that took place in Washington, D.C. that day, but the most commonly cited that I've seen and heard is Insurrection Day, which of course the use of the word day in describing it almost has a sense of remembrance akin to a holiday. This isn't the first time that an event that ended in violence and motivating people to action has been labeled a holiday of sorts. December 7th, 1941 is a day of infamy, per the words of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and in some calendars you can still see it listed as Pearl Harbor Day even in 2022. Even now, decades later, Americans across the country have had their calendars filled with all sorts of federal and local holidays that aren't really living up to the meaning of the phrase Holy Day in a traditional religious sense. But as G.K. Chesterton aptly put it, once abolish the god, and the government becomes the god. To say that the United States is a Christian nation, or any other actual religion like Islam or Buddhism, would be an insult to those religions. Rather, we are ruled, or have been ruled, by a civic religion of the nation, of its heroes, its founding, and the mythos of its growth of the American people. Or, a political formula, as Ganteo Mosca might put it. And such, to keep the people reinforced and hooked on this formula, ritualistic traditions, remembrances, all in the framework of the political narrative that has been formed, creates and gives way to political holidays. Political holidays, or holidays as Mrs. Radlib likes to call them, are not the holy days of Easter or the Nativity Fast, but are done for an explicit political purpose, either for winning votes or to gain a political advantage, but it is most likely done for the purpose of propagating a political formula, to change the current narrative and the values of the population. And in changing the narrative, and creating a new political formula for the country, enter the two-story state. The two-story state, a term coined by Curtis Garvin, describes the two-story state as the following. When people hear one story, they tend to ask, is this true? When they hear two stories, they tend to ask, which one of these is true? Isn't that a neat trick? Maybe our whole world is built on it. At any point in which both poles concur is a shared story, uncontroversial, bipartisan consensus." End quote. The one-story state being one of which a country or community is built on one shared singular narrative. But, Yarvin continues, Shared story has root privilege. It has no natural enemies and is automatically true. Injecting ideas into it is non-trivial and hence lucrative. This profession is called PR. There is no reason to assume that either pole of the spectrum of conflict, or the middle, or the shared story is any closer to reality than the single pole of the one-story state. Dividing the narrative has not answered the old question. Is any of this true? Rather, it has dodged it. Stagecraft. This is even better than supposing that, since we fought Hitler, and Hitler was bad, we must be good. These very basic fallacies, or psychological exploits, are deeply embedded in our political operating systems. Like bugs in code, they are invisible until you look straight at them. Then they are obvious." End quote. With this in mind, we will be able to apply this concept to our current state civic religions, as there are indeed two of them that exist in the United States now. One of them, of the Anglo-Europeans establishing a new settlement and braving a new world for both freedom of religion and the desire to be one's own man within his covenant and community, that would emerge from it a righteous society and revolution, with a limited government, negative rights, and power to its states over a central authority, which would go on to conquer the continent, its neighbors, and put a man on the moon, and announce to the world that anyone could be a part of it. The other, 
saying that the previous religion was built on the backs and blood of black and brown bodies, genocide, slavery, and the exploitation of the lower classes, which must be erased and transformed in order to have a more equitable and just society for the diverse and proud nation that America has become. So, to appropriate a little bit of Yarvin, if I were to offer you one religion, you would ask, is this true? But if I offered you two religions, one of them saying that the other is racist and evil, you would ask, which one of these is in the right morally? Funny how that works. And over the course of the last several decades, we have seen this take place for the sake of political movements, narratives, as well as the hopes of electoral advantages, but most importantly to change our current political formula. Whether it was Reagan's support of Martin Luther King Jr. Day becoming a federal holiday, or Trump's own efforts with Juneteenth, a holiday he said he put on the map and supported it for the hopes of winning black voters, they are now, of course, the work for the new narrative, the political formula we see out of our current set of elites, the regime, and manufactured public opinion. We see it now more than ever, and in a coordinated fashion, done so to help replace and prop up this new state religion. Columbus Day, once for Italian Americans, is now Indigenous Peoples Day. And the UK, Canada, and the United States all have their gay pride months on different months of the year, as if to keep the flamboyant party going. And now Juneteenth is officially a federal holiday, renewing the effort to erase parts of American history, defame its political founders as bigots and slave owners, and replace them in the popular culture in a mumble-rapping minstrel show. But at least that's considered cringe for now. All of this culminates, however, with the anniversary of the events that took place on January 6, 2021. The final defeat of their orange devil. Proof that they cannot trust their American flag-waving neighbors, and just how fragile and threatened their precious democracy is, no matter how fortified the results may be. And so, in the name of that holy vanguard that is liberal democracy, today is now a day of infamy one of which will be a part of the official canon to that new state religion. For many Americans, the ones in flyover country waving their Let's Go Brandon flags and adherence to the old state religion, find themselves lost, wondering what happened to the America they once knew, and are suddenly realizing that they are the imps and demons to the great Satan that almost cost their democratic and diverse paradise everything. But the real loss is not the old state religion, not the old civic narratives of about Neil Armstrong or Paul Bunyan. It is instead our actual religions. Going back to work this week in the office, I was given a corporate calendar. Skimming through it and the images that came along with the calendar, I noticed only three holidays of any actual religions on it. Hanukkah, Easter, and Christmas. Pride Month, Juneteenth, Indigenous Peoples Day, and countless other holidays were displayed all over. So today, lament political prisoners, lament the loss of old narratives and histories, and know that G.K. Chesterton was right. Work, thankfully, is being done on our own calendars, our own political holidays, but most importantly, to keep our faith and religious traditions alive well into these secular, liberal times. Until next time, everyone, take care and be prudent.